we have uh, Kim Willie to talk about uh, quarter reporting and uh, Roy Shapira to discuss uh, afterwards. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kim Wiley. Nice to meet everybody. I think I've had a chance to speak to a few of you. And thank you so much to Tom and to Mark for inviting me. And um, it's my pleasure to delve a little bit further into quarterly reporting as much as the, the time will allow. It's, it's a very short time frame for a very, very big topic. And um, so when Tom asked me to present on this topic, I actually reached out to Marty Lipton um, just to, to get his uh, kind of initial thoughts. And, and as we all know, Marty is one of the, the, the founders of this conversation and the discussion on short termism. He's 91 uh, these days, but is still very, very active uh, in terms of his engagement with this discussion. Um, and, you know, as, as we would expect, and um, you've kind of seen through the reading, uh, Marty Lipton is very firmly in the camp that <clears throat> there should be an end to quarterly reporting to stop the, the scourge of, of short termism. Um, and when I told him I, I would be speaking further on this topic, he told me to give them hell. And um, uh, my first question was, was who exactly? Uh, Mark, I think he was meaning you. And your position with your book as the, uh, you know, the, the, the statement that short termism is not a problem. And as much as I would love to argue on, on Marty's behalf uh, that the end to quarterly reporting is the answer to all short termism problems, I, I fear um, that I cannot. Um, and in particular, uh, because of, I think, Mark's very provocative statement, and I'm just going to quote from Mark's book here, because I think um, it's, it's a very definitive statement. Uh, but ending quarterly reports will not have the desired impact. It is a small and bent arrow unworthy of its target. So it's a bold statement. Um, my analysis and my conclusions are not as strong. I think there is still some room for discussion in this area and, and perhaps a place for looking at quarterly reporting and whether or not it is going to be some type of solution to a problem that we see in capital markets. And, and to do so, I'm just going to quickly walk through this analysis, first looking at defining what we're talking about and then looking at, and my research has been in particular in comparisons between uh, regulatory reform in the UK and in the US and in the EU. I've looked a little bit broader. My, my background is in Canada and in offshore markets, but I think these are, are sort of the three primary jurisdictions where it's really helpful to have this analysis. And the underlying rationale for these reforms, why we're still talking about this, and is quarterly reporting actually short termists based on the evidence that we have today? And, and finally, if it is, will the reforms actually be effective? And then to provide a few concluding remarks. So what are we talking about when we're talking about quarterly reporting? And there's all sorts of different types of financial reporting that we could be looking at and bringing into the short termism discussion. But what we're talking about today is very narrow and is focused on the reports that financial that um, publicly listed companies provide on a quarterly basis. And these are generally uh, these are unaudited statements. The, the fourth quarter is the annual audited statement. And what they're meant to do is assist asset owners. And that's a big bucket uh, of different individuals and institutions and uh, help them make prudent investment decisions. Okay, so this is a tiny slide and I apologize and I believe the slides are circulated afterwards so you'll have this as a resource. But just a quick snapshot of what the requirements are in each of these three different jurisdictions. Uh, the SEC Form 10-Q has been around for quite some time, quarterly reporting in the state. And, and 
interesting here that I just wanted to note, and this is a whole separate kind of tangent, so I'll just lob this out here, but the idea of earnings, uh, earnings projections are actually not part of the requirements for SEC reporting, but are certainly widely used in US capital markets. And it's an entirely different discussion on whether or not those types of earning projections should be looked at in the context of the short-termism discussion uh, and perhaps additional uh, regulation put in place. In the UK, since 2014, there's been a move from quarterly reporting to allowing companies to uh, report on a semi-annual basis. And the UK was uh, very proud to have brought that in one year before the EU directive, uh, which did the same thing around quarterly reporting and moving to semi-annual reporting in the EU. And I'm by no means an expert on um, EU law and regulation, but I understand that quarterly reporting is still relevant uh, for certain EU listed companies uh, because of the rules for particular exchanges in the EU. Okay, so in terms of the rationale for these reforms, we have some pretty clear linkages, at least in the rhetoric, to fixing some type of short termism problem. In the UK, it was the, the K report, uh, where there's direct reference to removing quarterly reporting in order to reduce the per perceived pressures for short-term decision-making. And that's right out of the K report. Um, similar type of a rationale in the, uh, from the EU Parliament and Council when they're looking at the amendments to the Transparency Directive. And again, we see that short-termism language built into the rationale for why quarterly reporting uh, should be changed, the time frame should be changed to semi-annual. Um, so we've seen actual regulatory reform in this area based on short-termism concerns. In the U.S., it, this is still very much a live discussion, and I'm not going to get into uh, the whole background of that discussion in the U.S. other than just to, to point out uh, the SEC request for comments, which came out of Donald Trump's statement on um, requesting to the SEC that this issue be looked at. And there's still live comments there, um, and it would be quite interesting, and I think Mark has perhaps done uh, this to some degree, to go through all of those comments and to identify the various stakeholder groups which are coming out in favor of moving to semi-annual reporting or uh, some other different time frame away from quarterly reporting versus those that are uh, very entrenched in the idea of keeping quarterly reporting. Uh, in the UK, some of the statistics are coming out now about companies moving from quarterly uh, from uh, quarterly reporting to semi-annual reporting. Each year, those numbers seem to increase. Um, and then, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with in the EU market, there have been some suggested reforms which are either meant to discourage or entirely prohibit quarterly reporting. So remember, in the EU, we've had this move to semi-annual reporting and companies can still volunteer report quarterly, but there's a proposal to actually move even further and, and to prevent companies from providing quarterly reports to their shareholders. Okay, so that, since this is very much a live debate, the question is, is short-termism evident in quarterly reporting? Is this somehow connected to the problem? So we've heard lots of different definitions uh, that kind of all narrow in on this kind of similar concept, right? That the perceived problem is that investors value short-term financial returns over potentially more profitable longer-term investment opportunities. Uh, in the context of quarterly reporting, this means that investors and their intermediaries through which they act can be impatient and they unduly react to quarterly reports. They may sell shares and negatively impact share price, causing companies to focus on short-term results. So we, as we've heard, and we've been through in numerous presentations today, there are very mixed reviews in, in terms of how we measure these harms. And, and we do need some, arguably some evidence of harmful behavior in order to move to the next step, which is whether or not we actually change reporting timeframes. 
Um, and so I'm not going to answer the question on whether or not um, there is evidence of a short termism problem. I think certainly the evidence is, is mixed on whether or not there is a problem. But I think what's helpful for this part of the discussion is making the assumption that even if we assume there is a short termism problem, which, you know, like we said, requires uh, some additional evidence, I think, to move the, the needle from uh, to, a, to a yes or a no or a more likely probability. Even if we accept that short termism is harmful, how does changing the reporting periods fix that problem? And, and in, in my uh, doctoral research, I tried to come up with some type of framework where we could measure regulatory reform. And, and what I did was I, I looked at all different types of regulatory reform in each of uh, the different jurisdictions that I've mentioned and tried to say, is it really just rhetoric? Is, is, the, is the short termism concept being kind of thrown at these regulatory reforms that's essentially kind of disguising something else? Or assuming that there is a problem, and again, putting the evidentiary kind of issues to the side for a moment, how does this reform actually fix the problem. And one of those areas that I looked at was in the context of quarterly reporting. And I said that there's got to be uh, this dual pathway. Essentially, the reform has to do one of two things. One of those things is it actually has to make investors better. It has to do this very difficult thing of enlightening investors to this longer term way of thinking. Again, big assumption that we think a longer term way of thinking is actually a better, more productive way to think for society. Uh, but if we if we think that, how do we enlighten investors? And that's that's one of the ways that regulatory reform can actually uh, positively address the short termism problem. The other way, if we think those short term pressures are bad and they're harmful, we have to cut off the transmission mechanism inside the firm. And this brings us into that somewhat awkward position where we have to insulate managers and their decision making, which um, ends up with uh, that Baptist and bootlegger problem where you have kind of two very differing types of interest groups converging on, on one particular approach that uh, traditionally you wouldn't see those interest groups actually aligning on. And, and so you either need to insulate managers and as part of that, you need to you need to tweak the compensation of managers towards a more longer term perspective. So if you do both of those things or you enlighten your shareholder base, then you may go some distance towards fixing a problem. Again, assuming that there's a problem to fix in the first place. So how does this stack up against quarterly reporting and the issues around quarterly reporting? Ending mandatory quarterly reporting could potentially improve or enlighten your, your investors by forcing them to think a little bit longer term. So rather than just waiting for you know, those, those sort of three month results, now they're waiting six months. Um, but these are voluntary reforms and not being opted into certainly uh, even by a majority of the issuers in the jurisdictions in which uh, the reforms are put in place. Um, and uh, there's nothing being done to change the quality of the information that's being provided to investors. So whether or not you give that information to investors in three month period or six month period, if it's the same type of quality of information, you'll arguably end up um, with the same issues. So uh, perhaps a way, again, if we accept that there is a short termism problem and we want to improve or enlighten investors or, or give them a little bit more time to think, then the outright ban on quarterly reporting and moving to a mandatory semi-annual period may help with that enlightenment. But that brings in a lot of assumptions uh, that definitely can be challenged. Um, the second pathway of this is if we insulate company management, uh, which again, giving them a little bit of distance between reporting periods may do, and, but in the absence of <laughs> some type of um, changes to executive compensation would not be particularly effective. So um, rather than kind of providing any definitive 
statement here on the effectiveness of quarterly reporting, I just wanted to sum up with uh, a few concluding remarks. The first is this is very much a live debate. And uh, as, as we've seen, the hard evidence of there being a short-termism problem is inconclusive. So um, there's a lot of room for additional analysis. And I think we also have a really interesting opportunity. When we started talking about short-termism uh, in depth, you know, five, 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of regulatory changes that purported to be driven by short-termism. Now we do. We have this end to quarterly reporting and optional uh, semi-annual reporting in the EU and the UK and companies choosing one route or another, which gives us a, um, a, a sort of lens to look at this issue on uh, you know, a particular firm by firm basis. Obviously, uh, there's potential issues there because it's quite difficult to, to make um, you know, statements about the harms as a whole when we're just looking at sort of a, a piece um, of the uh, of the activity within a in a firm. Um, the other important point to make is that we cannot look at timing of quarterly reporting without looking at the quality of corporate reporting. So what goes into the reports is arguably just as important as the time frame uh, with which it's produced. And um, so in the meantime, uh, there may be some really good reasons why. Uh, why we don't want to continue with quarterly reporting. In my, my private practice as an M&A lawyer, I hear from company all the time about the pressures of providing information to shareholders on a, sort of an ongoing basis and the increasing costs associated with doing so. But cost reduction is a completely different policy point than short-termism. It may be equally valid, and if that's what we mean when we're talking about reducing quarterly reporting and moving to longer timeframes, then let's talk about it in those terms. Let's talk about it in terms of reducing the costs to listed companies. And, and as part of that discussion, we need to also think about if we do reduce um, the reporting periods, what are going to be the overall costs of doing so? Are there going to be issues around shareholders then bringing their own perceptions in um, into you know, what they think is going on with the firm? Are there going to be concerns then that um, shareholders may uh, not be able to adequately judge what's happening uh, within a company or, or pick up some potential liquidity issues or, or larger issues uh, involving the company? So unfortunately, I, I couldn't give you hell about this. And I think we, we've we landed in a position with quarterly reporting where there may be some very valid policy reasons to look at changing reporting periods, but short-termism isn't top of the list. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, ECGI, for putting up this conference. And like Theo, I think I'm going to veer from the uh, norm in academic conferences of trying to pick holes in the the paper that, that I'm discussing, uh, partly because I think that Kim did a great balanced job in laying out the issues in trying to fight uh, corporate short termism through reducing the frequency of reporting. What I want to do is to spotlight that I mentioned that I think is lurking underneath everything that we discussed here. And uh, this is the political economy dimension. So if you recall Mark's uh, keynote from the beginning of the day, the four dimensions, uh, is there a short termism problem and the cure, does the cure fit the issue? So, in focused on one, two, three, mainly three, I'm going to focus on four, like the political and psychology aspects of trying to reduce corporate shortermism via reducing the frequency of reporting. So I think we should start the discussion with this. Okay. Ask yourself, when was the last time you saw a presidential tweet about a corporate governance issue? <laughs> there are many corporate governance issues that are important, like uh, uh, controlling shareholder transactions and protections or appraisal rights, but you never see the president tweeting about MFW or majority of minority requirements, right? So why this? Okay, and it's not just Trump, you can dismiss it by saying it's Trump, but Jesse already named names and Mark already used the uh, Joe Biden wealthy journal example. So I won't elaborate, I'll just ask why is this so salient? We saw in Zakaria's keynote that this channel in this channel the evidence is mixed at best, right? There are other channels where the evidence is relatively stronger. 
So why is this channel so widely believed and so salient in the public agenda, in the media agenda, even in the political agenda? And I think it's because it's more politically palatable, right? It makes more sense, evidence-wise, to focus on like the quality of reporting instead of the timing of reporting, or to focus on executive compensation, like we heard, instead of the frequency of reporting, right? But focusing on these other issues is more, is politically harder, right? You would go, you would alienate strong players, right? By fighting for reducing the frequency of reporting, you can build coalitions with these strong players. The Trump tweet, the way that he tweeted it, the way that it was discovered in the press, was about, I don't blame the CEOs. It's not their fault. Biden actually says so explicitly in the Wall Street Journal op-ed. He says so explicitly, I don't blame the CEOs, period. Okay? And when Mark and I tried to check who, who were the ones that, are, that originated these narratives and these ideas and who we are, are spreading it now, we saw that these are usually the top consultants to management. Right. Martin Lipton coined the term shorter in 1979, has been spreading it ever since. Give them hell. And uh, so the top legal consultant for corporate managers, and Dominique Barton from McKinsey was the one that coined the term quarterly capitalism. Jesse used, and McKinsey has been spreading it ever since. Right? So Jesse had the, 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 the slide with Lazonic smiling. He was smiling because he won the McKinsey Award. Mm -hmm. And Zakaria said the game, the game show slide. We, we had to guess who was the quote. And Paulson gave the quote in a McKinsey study. Right? So the point is that if I'm a manager or if I'm a consultant to managers, I can't just go on and say, I'm advocating for less managerial accountability or less frequent. I want to insulate managers from frequent accountability. It doesn't go well, right? I'm better off saying I'm fighting to reduce frequent reporting because this will let us focus on the long-term growth. And there's another story, and this is not a study, just a complete conjecture, but along the same line, it's investor versus investors. When you reduce the frequency of reporting, it favors professional investors who have this constant backdoor channel to communicating with management. So this might be the best explanation of why we see these very different views between investors' bodies in the UK versus investor bodies elsewhere in the world. Again, just to conjecture, you could say that investment bodies in, in the UK, big institutional investors have these professional relationships, engagement with management, with listed companies that allow them to compensate for less frequent reporting. They don't need it. Elsewhere in the world, you would usually see investors' bodies going against reducing the frequency of reporting. In fact, it's even more than that. It allows you to bring even more people on board, broader coalitions, not just investors and managers, also workers and environmentalists. Right? If you look at the stated rationale for the EU regulation that Kim discussed, this is to encourage <coughs> sustainable, right? sustainable value creation. Sustainable is the mother of all narrative. Who can object to it? Right? And shareholders are hearing this. And they're thinking, great, so reducing the frequency of reporting will prevent the company from hurting me. And stakeholders are hearing it and saying, great, reducing the frequency of reporting will prevent the company from hurting others. Right? But the smart already kind of drove home the point. It's a question of who pays rather than when they pay. It's an externality issue. And the way that I wanted to illustrate it is by using my favorite example, which is DuPont. Okay, DuPont is the quintessential long-term green company. Right? Uh, Zacharias gave us the study of um, who reports on, 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 on climate risk, DuPont is, is reporting. They're always winning all the CSR accolades. But at the same time, they were also embroiled in one of the most disastrous environmental debacles of our time, when for six decades, they emitted a highly toxic chemical, or PF4A, to the environment while making Teflon. So people inside DuPont knew in real time that the chemical was highly toxic, and that it is uh, bioaccumulative and bioperistant meaning that it doesn't break in the environment, never breaks in the environment, and it builds in our blood, our body cannot get rid of it. Yet they still opted to continue. So how can such a bad corporate behavior happen to such a good company? So Luigi Zingales and I uh, did a study and we showed that it kind of pays for long-term shareholders to pollute like that. If you held to pawn stock for 60 years, you greatly benefited from the long-term 60 years pollution. Okay, and the point is that if you want to fight not like, like, um, environmental degradation, the point was not fixated on financial reporting. The point was not bothered by hedge funds activists at the time. Right? If you want to do something like that, you better fix it through, say, incentivizing whistleblowers from inside the company to come out and to fix the extreme information asymmetries that exist with such toxic chemicals or change the regulation in some way, not through reducing the frequency of financial reporting. I want to end with this. 
It could be that in 2023, it's kind of anachronistic to talk about quarterly reporting, okay? Because we're seeing companies moving to constant reporting through dashboards, constantly pushing information to the market. And we're seeing short sellers uh, using AI to target companies for even a slight delay in pushing data to the market, right? So I don't think that frequent reporting is going to go away anytime soon. If you want to fight corporate short-termism or if you want to reduce environmental degradation, your best bet is probably elsewhere. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Kim, do you want to react to this or? Uh, no, but it is an interesting point on AI, and we were speaking about that before the presentation on whether or not really this is outdated, this idea of quarterly and semi-annually, if, if really what we should be talking about is daily reporting or live time reporting. Nano reporting. Yes, well, and it, it brings into the discussion about a, a lot of the reporting that corporations do, including earnings projections, is voluntary. It's not mandated. So to what extent should legislation mandate reporting and, and to what extent should corporations be left to kind of have that communication with their shareholders? If there's value in lifetime reporting and shareholders value that, and would corporations not naturally migrate to that level of reporting? Just one, uh, you know, one, one additional dimension that I think is important. Um, so, of course, quarterly reporting means uh, you have to prepare on a quarterly basis data that you provide to the markets. But if I understand it correctly, the, the kind of criticism is more about the interplay between the reporting and what analysts on a quarterly basis are expecting, right? And mm -hmm. so therefore, you know, in, in the kind of ideal world, you would want to separate this. Is the problem coming from quarterly reporting? If there would not be earnings forecasts on a quarterly basis, probably not. Right? So if we believe this is a problem, then we would first have to think about, you know, what, you know, what, what do we do in terms of the analyst side, right? And, you know, they are not sure that this is a problem because we know that the analysts are having an important role uh, in terms of disciplining the firm. And then would the regulatory fix not be banning earnings projections, which instead of changing the quarterly reporting period, to, to say outright that companies can't provide earnings projections. And then the impact, the cost to the market in terms of, of the liquidity uh, impact would be fairly significant. Maybe, not sure if it's the company or the analyst, right? Because the, the I think it's more, it's less the, the, the if, if the company is voluntarily making a forecast that it cannot meet, of course, it's a problem. But it's more, I think, like I mentioned earlier, that the analysts are for, forming a consensus what, what they expect to come in. Right. And, Based on this, there is the whole capital budgeting planning process mm -hmm. to arrive, and that's where I think managers would claim the, the short-termism is coming from, mm -hmm. right? Unless we're cutting R&D by X and Y, we're not going to kind of deliver these earnings per share. So I think it's it's more this channel that, that is the concern rather than the pure back of what we're importing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mark, also other questions? Um, well, I might build on, on this in a little, little bit. Is that to the extent what, what the problem is, um, there's a projection out there and management feels absolutely compelled to get to that projection and will do all kinds of distorted behavior. Question is whether changing the reporting frequency really helps. Yeah. The, the, the short term uh, statement, maybe back to Marty, is uh, six months is just not the long term. Yeah. And if analysts are making a mess of things for some companies over three months, the same thing will happen over six months. And you could imagine that because the firm is not um, in the public eye for another three months, conceivably dark for, for six months instead of instead of uh, three months minus a day, uh, that will be um, out of whack from the projections twice as much and therefore have to scramble twice as much and therefore do if this uh, uh, meeting what the analysts want is, uh, is important um do twice as much damage to the uh, to the uh, to the company um, now some of this is created by management putting out projections which they don't have to do um, but some of this is just created will be created and is created by the analysts themselves the analysts come up with a consensus projection and then most managements feel they have to either explain it away or get to it. Um, there's a related thing. Um, um, 
Bob Posen and uh, Raj Kapoor have a paper about some of the things that happened in Britain after uh, went to uh, went off a quarterly uh, quarterly reporting. And two things that I found interesting: well, there didn't seem to be any significant change in investment. Um, second thing is the analysts really want to know what's going on in real time, and if they can't get it directly from management, uh, Roy's point that there are other channels of information, uh, what they were trying to do is extrapolate from in, in valuing British Airways. They try to extrapolate from the quarterly report of American Airlines and United to figure out what was probably happening with British Airways to come up with a valuation every, uh, every three months. The last thing is um, some of this may just be a package deal. It probably really are distortions related to quarterly reporting. But if we want a public market, um, this might be one of the prices that we have to pay for a public market stock. Yeah, and I think the point there too is that you can a, a UK or an EU market <coughs> make these changes in isolation when the US still requires quarterly reporting. Is do we have a harmonization issue? And and like you said, they're they're looking to US firms, and a lot of firms actually are feeling the pressure to continue with quarterly reporting. So does that does that lead to the argument uh, that US quarterly reporting should be looked at? You know, with greater significance potentially, and can we extrapolate based on the UK and the EU any sort of meaningful kind of statistics or, or guidance in, in terms of that experiment? Jesse, you're getting older. So I, I'm sort of a, a corporate governance libertarian, although not fully. Um, and I'm also interested in like experimentation and learning from pilot studies and sort of efforts that don't completely change an entire market, but provide an, an, an opening for, for, for new ways of doing things. So one of the things that you could do with quarterly reporting is you could say, okay, um, if public shareholders agree that the company can move to you know, reporting every six months or every year, um, and you just look at unaffiliated stockholders who let the company do it, and or companies going public that have to negotiate with investors through investment banks, we, we let them choose from a variety of options. Mm -hmm. my, my sense is that, um, <clears throat> is that you would not see a single company um, through this type of consensual process, whether it's at the IPO or midstream, actually move to anything other than what we have now. But since I'm not sure, and there may be some advantages to doing things differently, like we, we could let people experiment. Mm -hmm. Instead of spending decades arguing about whether we should have mandatory quarterly reporting or like something else that's mandated for everybody, just like let, let the market try to figure it out. And it would be interesting because I would think in that circumstance that potentially some of the very large players who felt comfortable with their shareholder base may be the ones to try and experiment. They may say, look, we see the value in this and, and we know our shareholders and we have our communication channels and you know, we feel that you're reporting twice a year is plenty and we're going to free up management time to focus on other things. And perhaps it's the middle markets that would feel compelled to kind of continue as their competitors were doing. And the other piece to that, too, is we're sort of lumping all types of firms kind of in as one in this discussion. And perhaps there's a kind of graduating. But a lot of that doesn't focus on short termism. It focuses on the costs of reporting and the time and effort that goes into that level of reporting and the feedback from analysts and, you know, that sort of pace of modern markets. And maybe those are the conversations that should move up the list in advance of the short termism discussion. 2023 technology kind of reduces these costs, the direct costs. Mm -hmm. And going back to, uh, to GNC and to what you said, I think this is kind of similar to the debate over regulating insider trading. If you go back to the previous point, right? And when you regulate it, you benefit analysts or whatever. If you don't, in terms of uh, financial reporting, in terms of frequency, who will it favor? Some institutional investors with strong engagement down with management over others. Do you want it or not? I think that's the policy question. Order. 
Uh, both as a theorist and as an empiricist, I will uh, argue against uh, letting companies yeah. choose this themselves. And uh, you know, certainly for learning, the ideal thing would be if they are if they are thinking about mandating semi-annual instead of for, uh, quarterly reporting. You probably gathered I'm a libertarian also in many ways. Um, they should mandate it only for half the companies, at least in a particular segment, force the other ones <laughs> to maintain the quality. Why that? I and mean, obviously, from a empirical point of view, then we'll really learn uh, what works. But from a, from a theoretical point of view, there is one good argument for mandatory rules when there's contracts, which is signaling. And I think um, I'm not sure that certain companies would move to semi-annual because even though they might think it would be better if everybody did that, making that step, it really depends on the expectations, but it could be that it's a signal that people are worried that only the weak will do that. And that a strong company, even though they think it's harmful for them uh, in isolation, um, they, can, they, they can deal with it and they don't want to be seen as weak. And so we'll get a weird selection of companies that does it and maybe nobody will do it, even though it will be good for everybody. So uh, if one is worried about it, I think one should force companies to do it. And ideally, to learn, we should force only half. Well, the, <laughs> isn't the uh, signaling challenge, you can also say they work backwards in a sense yes. of like a costly signaling yes. company handicapping itself, saying mm -hmm. that the direction in which it works right. is not clear. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have a, uh, yeah. you'd need, you'd need a, a, a very bold business leader. It's a shame Elon Musk is out of the game because he, he might just have his own vision or you know a type of leader that would decide i this is something i see valuable to me my shareholders as opposed yeah. to weighing a lot of other externalities the okay there in, in it's Porsche in germany because there is actually a choice depending on which segment you're in there's and semi-annual or quarterly and then uh, so Porsche was moved to the bigger index and then uh, vd king back then said we're not going to do it we're not going to do quarterly and he explained it to the shareholders, but he was sued then uh, because of the stock exchange requirement, and then you know forced to do this. But so there is some 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 choice. But still, if you choose to stay in this index, there's still a signaling issue uh, that Olga pointed out. I'm going to also ask a question to you, Kim. Um, I was wondering. Like I mentioned in my presentation that quarterly reporting, banning it or reforming it, probably wouldn't make that much of a a difference is if you have a controlling shareholder. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of, of, of that statement? Because as I understand your point of view, well, changing reporting frequency would mainly about be about educating institutional investors. So if you have a controlling shareholder, that doesn't really matter much anyway, I would think. Yeah, and I think in your presentation, you did a really great job of outlining that all controlling shareholders are not alike. And I think that comes down to what are the intentions of a particular controlling shareholder. And if that particular controlling shareholder had a sort of truly long-term approach, then you know, perhaps quarterly reporting wouldn't matter because they would hold that approach regardless. But if a controlling shareholder, for example, didn't have you know, a particularly long-term approach, then maybe that extra breathing room would provide some benefits to enlightening or encouraging them towards a longer term perspective. So kind of comes down to not lumping all controlling shareholders into one bucket. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Then uh, I believe we can move to the panel discussion and thank our speaker for